Okay, let us, let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we are thankful for your love, grace, and mercy, what you have for us. We are thankful for putting uh, your message on the heart of Pastor Marino, and we pray to guide him to, to deliver this message to us. May your word soften and mold our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Pastor, amen. Thank you. Well, it's great uh, that I'm uh, with you because last weekend I was not. I was uh, at a conference uh, or a gathering in Tirana and it was, it was wonderful. But unfortunately, I just didn't like the fact that they had it over a weekend. I'm like, come on, guys, we're people from the church and you want us to be away from our churches on Sunday. Like, next time, think it through better. <laughs> but thank God, uh, uh, you're all wonderful. So... Even if the pastor is not here, the church continues because this is God's church and not pastor's church. Um, recently, I came over a post and I really liked it. So uh, uh, I found it through uh, friends of mine. And uh, now, of course, I'm not going to quote all the names that should be probably involved in that. But uh, I liked it because it was on the theme of Father's heart. And it says that um, one morning... Uh, a father woke up and realized that uh, his three-year-old was next to him and, uh, you know, taking a pen and, and the Bible and scribbling over the Bible. And, of course, it was like taking out a pen, like, oh, already done. And the child said, hi, daddy. Well, of course, that would be like a normal response from a three-year-old child, unless that child is autistic and non-verbal. And suddenly, the eyes of the father were filled with tears. Like, my child speaks. And he started complaining to God that he has a child, he has this daughter that he wants to speak so much with. But she lives in her own world, completely, with her realities that he cannot enter. And he felt such great pain. And God interrupted his thoughts. We will continue with the rest of the story at the end. But of course, as you can imagine, I want to talk about a father's heart. The heart of our father. And we do have, of course, many texts. And I chose several that I want, wanted to just hear father's heart for us. When, uh, when I was in high school, you know, the informatics was just about to become something in this world. And back then, uh, we still had, uh, if uh, any one of you remembers, uh, uh, those cards. And they were like doing holes, you know, and they were like, that's computer. And I was like, what is this? And not only that, it was, that, that thing was like a half of a room like a big huge room that you had to have and like this is computer running and it's like what is this now when we have everything you know like in a little you know iPad or iPhone or phone whatever kind you know and then basically you have that computer in your hand you know it was just unimaginable back then you know that we were going to have something that is going to do things for us and of course we all know what we can do these days. You know, you, in real time, you can see each other, talk to each other in two different parts of the world. So back then, we were learning these program languages. And one of them had this command, repeat until. And our, our professor, she said that she was in a bank, and suddenly uh, her, you know, her, her line, you know, her turn came, and she was like, pulling the papers like here, and the, the lady behind the counter says, sorry, my disc is full. <laughs> of course, she, she said, I knew immediately what was the problem. And then being the teacher of informatics, I'm like, do you need another disc? <laughs> of course, the lady was like, show, because she didn't know what to do with it. And she was like, no, the disc is full. And the lady, and the teacher professor goes, yeah, yeah, I know. She said, basically, the program that she had, had for example, 100 people per day. So the program hit 100, and it was done. There was no more, it was no more open for another information. 
it was repeat until 100. And I was wondering, why did they ever put a limit to it? I mean, like, why limit? What if there are 150 people in the bank that day and they wanted to process their, or post, whatever, they wanted to process their requests? Why there should be a limit? How many times are we allowed repeat until when we come to our Heavenly Father? Do we have a limit? Is there a limit? One text that I admire, and I, when I read it first time, I was like really blown by it, and it was many years ago. And it's found in Isaiah uh, 49, verse 15. And we're going to read verse 16 too. Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? Though she may forget, I will not forget you. See, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are ever before me. I deliberately included even this part of verse 16 about walls because it is there and it's very important. God's love, God's work for his people is done in this world. We are not somehow elevating above this world and then we meet God's love and then we experience God's love and then we go down to this world and we're like, okay, we're back into this world again. There is no kind of matrix, so to speak, experience. We, in the same time, live in this world and experience the love of the Father. So, in the context of uh, God and His promises and His protection, these walls around Jerusalem are the best symbol what protection means. Now, the problem of the times when this text comes in Isaiah is that the walls are destroyed. And God is telling them, you see these walls, they are destroyed. But my love, my protection for you is not destroyed. I engraved you on the palms of my hands. This is what we call in theology anthropomorphism. So to God we ascribe human terms. So we say God has hands. Well, does God have really hands? But... This kind of language is so important. Why? Because it creates this connection between God and us. We understand much closer who God is and how He acts with us when we understand this kind of language. Because we can easily look at the palms of our hands. And we can imagine God looking at the palms of His hands. He says, see, I engraved you. You are always before me. I see you. And God sees you in your situation, whether you're smiling, whether you're crying, whether you are under a lot of pressure, whatever your situation may be, God sees you because He engraved us on the palms of His hands. You see, this speaks so much to us and we feel much closer to God as opposed to the language that we would hear in other parts of the Bible, of course, that there are these languages of God being on the throne and He's ruler of the universe and everything is under His command and that's true and we need that too. But also we need to hear His heart when He says that He engraved us on the palms of his hands and he is looking at the palms of his hands and he sees us. What a heart of our Father. So, now we go back to the verse 15. Hmm, can a mother forget a child? Very, you know, like, unlikely situation. And, of course, when we, when we think about this, especially in the days of the text written and history for so much time, to be honest, what did it mean that 
you sit, suddenly decide not to live with your family. Mm. For so many hundreds of years, that was simply not existing. When the era of industrialization starts to happen, and then when we have these moves of people to the industry, to the cities, suddenly you are alone in this city. But for most of the history, people were living with their families. And your family is there with you, and therefore, everything was there. You know, that they didn't have social services. You didn't have, you know, some office there to call and like, look, we have a need of this, and they will be sending. No, everything was done in the family. There was no retirement system, so elderly people, once they cannot work anymore, the rest of the family would provide for them. And today we have this nicely imagined, like, there is a retirement system, we don't have to worry about elderly people, they have enough money and they can pay, whatever. And we kind of put things totally different than God originally wanted them. So can a mother forget a child? Well, really not. And especially, hardly back then, unless she had some mental issues or demon possession. But today, you see, now in the European Parliament was um, voted that abortion is a fundamental human right. Can you imagine that the fundamental right is considered a killing? But, but listen to the trickery of the words. This is the health of the reproductive system for ladies. Come on. I am healthy because somebody else has to suffer and that somebody else is a baby in the womb. And not to consider the responsibility of lifestyle and once the child is conceived the responsibility for the life that is about to be born. So much upside down. But can a mother forget a child? Well, possibly. And, of course, that motherly love is just taken. And even today, we speak in the same language. We always talk about mother's love. And we know what we mean by mother's love. So though hardly imaginable, God's words sound so much assuring. Well, even if that happens, which is hardly imaginable, that a mother would forget her child, God says, I will never. And then he says, I engrave you in the palms of my hands. So we are with him all the time. He says, I cannot, there is no way I can forget him about you. Now, let us go on to the text in the Gospel of John 3.16. I guess that is the one that everyone learns among the first parts of the Bible when uh, each one of us becomes a believer. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And I will continue to the verse 21. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what he has done has been done through God. And I love this part. And this is when Paul picks this up and says in Ephesians that all the deeds that we do 
we do them because they are already prepared for us in advance by God. So there is nothing that we can boast about. However, we are called to live with God who is light. I'm just going to do a little diversion from the theme. and we, we barely speak about hell these days. And hell is reality. And I'm, going, I'm not denying it. I'm going away from it. But I don't see a need to speak about a hell because I want to speak about running to the Father, living in the light. And when I'm living with, father, with the Father in the light, I don't have to be afraid of hell. I don't need the fear of hell to be spoken about because I want to live with the Father who is the light. So our Father is light and He invites us to live with Him. And so He wants us to live this light. And His gift to us is so valuable. He paid the price. This is something that, that I find really, really amazing. Because it's hard for us to understand. Back in the days, of course, we can read this, especially in the Old Testament, because there were these other nations. And one of the things God was telling his people, do not look at their gods, because one of the things their gods were requiring is sacrifice of children. And when the Jewish people were disobedient and they were following those false gods, they were sacrificing their own children. Detestable practice. And yet, our God does not require a sacrifice of any of our children, but He gave a sacrifice of His one and only Son. Once and for all. And we have this highest example of love. He protected us from this pain of sacrificing our children. God does not require sacrifices of our children. And to show it, He has shown it in His own Son. How much the Father loves us. And we are given this gift of eternal life with Him. I want to also mention this uh, following um, a text in Matthew 23, 37. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her cheeks under her wings. But you... We're not willing. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Father wants to have relationship with his children. And what did he do? Throughout the history of God's people, we read that they were given signs, wonders, miracles, prophets sent to them. They were given that law that no in the history of humankind better was made and established or whatever word you want to find or attribute. And yet they and if we are honest enough we will say I run away because we think we know better. Well, thank you for all the prophets and all the signs and miracles and wonders, but, you know, I want to live my own way. I kind of like it. I don't want to have authority above my head. I am my own Lord. And of course, we know the tragedy that the Jewish people went through. And the Bible explains in different parts that everything negative happening to them, the consequences was of their disobedience to the love of the Father. Disobedience to the love of the Father. Am I, are you, 
willing to enjoy the love of the Father. And now there is uh, one more text, and of course you can uh, probably guess. Uh, Luke chapter 15, the, the parable of the lost son. I will read the parable, but emphasize definitely a uh, certain only aspect of the father's heart. We can talk very much and very long about the parable itself. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in while living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to, the, to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pots that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied. And your father has killed the fattened calf because he has, he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Let us hear the Father's heart. Well, if we look at the sons, neither of them understood the Father's heart nor the Father's love. <laughs> the younger one didn't get it till he got back. And the best, even in that case, when he was on the way, he thought like, well, if only I become a slave to my father, I will live happily ever after. And then the older one, well, he didn't get it either. He understood father's love in terms of task, doing everything that he was told, but not as a relationship father and son. The father didn't have a relationship with either of the sons. The younger one saw money and he took his share and took off. Well, the older one, he stayed, but 
it get, I guess he pursued the money also by staying. But what I love about the reaction of the father is that when he saw the younger coming, he ran to greet the younger son. And when the older one did not want to leave or come into the house, the father got out of the house to meet the older son. Whatever the situation, the father's heart has always been for his children. Whatever your situation, whatever my situation, let us be reminded that the father's heart is always <coughs> for you and I. So now I want to continue with the story that it says that Greg, oh, actually, that is the father's name in the, in the example I, I was giving you from the beginning. And it says, God interrupted Greg's lament and spoke these words to his heart. I know your pain. I, too, am a father. And oftentimes, my children fail to acknowledge my presence. Day in and day out, they repeat the same routine. Breakfast, work, dinner, Netflix, bed. They, too, live in their own little world. A world entrenched in hobbies, sports, materialism, binge-watching sitcoms, and Instagram surfing. I try everything imaginable to get their attention. I send people into their lives to interrupt their routines. I answer big and small prayers in hopes they will know my heart. I even went to the extreme of sending my son as an attempt to convey my love for them. I don't need them, but I desperately want them. They desperately need me, but don't want me. My greatest desire is for them to stop what they're doing and look into my eyes. I don't have a list of rules for them to follow or a regimented agenda for their lives. I just want a relationship. And I'm not mad. I do not care how many times they have scripted over, all over my story. I am the original author of their lives, and I'm creating a beautiful tale. If they would only hand me the pen. I tell them, I wait patiently for my child to look up and utter the words that cause my heart to skip a beat. Hi, Daddy. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your Father's heart. We thank you that you are such a wonderful Father. And you are faithfully waiting for us to come. Come back to you. Help us to look up. Help us to open our eyes in search for you. Help us to come to the place to understand that you love us so much and that we want to be in your presence. Help us to understand that you love us so much more than all these things that are happening in our lives, the things that we are asking, how long or where are you? And help us understand that you are with us, smiling and crying, whatever our situation is, because you are our Father. And you engrave us in the palms of your hands. And you always see us. We thank you for your love and your care. Amen.